starting over. Um, um, this meeting is being recorded. Thank you so much. Um, the Atlantis program hopes to advance Atlantic basin scale sustained ocean observing by actively supporting collaborative partnerships among the observing networks, um, data and information systems, and the wider use communities building on existing initiatives and past successes. This ocean hour that you're joining us for is an opportunity for community engagement as we develop the all Atlantic observing systems. The idea is we'll share ideas and pro progress on specific topics, um, use cases, projects, programs, um, and just bring together the community. So we invite everybody to participate since we all share common problems and goals focusing on the all Atlantic observing system and um, the Atlantis ocean hour um, our hope is will take place every month or every other month. Um, today, the Atlantic Ocean Hour, Atlantis Ocean Hour is focused on marine heat waves. And as we all know, marine heat waves um, are extreme climate events that can have devastating impacts causing abrupt ecological changes and socioeconomic uh, consequences. My name is uh, Dr. Ronellis Perez. I'm an oceanographer at NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory, and my work focuses on the tropical and South Atlantic ocean and climate variability. Um, I will pass the baton to Mariana so she can introduce herself. Sure. Uh, I am Mariana Rocha de Souza. I'm Brazilian, but I'm a, I am here in the US. Uh, I did my PhD in quarter reef biology, and I am right now a Canals Fellow placed at GOMO, the Global Ocean Monitoring Observing Program at NOAA. Great. So just to let you know a bit about the event flow, we're going to have three short 10 minute presentations. Thank you so much to our panelists and speakers. And then we'll follow that with a 30 minute panel discussion. So we'll try to hold all our questions till the end. Um, after the panel discussion, there's also going to be a networking event using Wonder Me that Mariana will tell us about at the end of the panel discussion. As Mariana said, the session is going to be recorded. So if possible, uh, please keep your microphones muted um, and use the chat feature to ask your questions or um, you know, raise your hands if you have that capability. I'm not sure if everybody has that capability today to ask questions at the end of the three presentations. Mariana is gonna keep track of time and let speakers know when they have a minute or two left to wrap up their talks. And so first I'd like to introduce our three speakers and then um, pass the, the microphone over to our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Regina Rodriguez, who's a professor of physical oceanography at the Universidad Federal, I'm sorry, Mari, I'm gonna mess this up, Federal de Santa Catarina in Brazil. Her research focuses on climate variability and change and air-sea interactions. And then our second speaker is Dr. Filipos Taglis, who is a postdoctoral associate at the University of Miami Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies. He works in the physical oceanography division and his work is focused on understanding changes in ocean circulation, biogeochemistry, with attention to uh, particular attention to nutrients and oxygen and the underlying mechanisms. And then our third speaker is Dr. Tatiana Reinerson, who's a professor of oceanography at the University of Rhode Island. And her research focuses on understanding how plankton diversity is shaped by both ecological and evolutionary processes. So I will very first thank all the speakers and pass the floor to um, Dr. Regina Rodriguez. Thank you, Renette, for the introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Is it okay? Okay. So uh, uh, I'd like to thank the invitation and I'm really happy to be here today uh, to talk about marine heat waves in the context of compound extreme events. Um, so uh, marine heat waves are period of extreme ocean temperatures. They can cause devastating impacts on marine life. They have different physical mechanisms and drivers. And in many cases, they can co-occur with other extremes in the ocean, such as extremes of uh, acidification and the oxygenation. Uh, but they, they can also uh, co-occur with extreme events on land, uh, such as droughts and heat waves. So in my talk, I will focus on the compound extreme of drought, land, and marine heat waves in the Western uh, South Atlantic region. So, um, but before uh, that, I should quickly explain how marine heat waves are defined according to the standard methodology uh, by Hobb Day et al. 2016. A marine heat wave event occurs when sea surface temperature, black, uh, represented by this black line here, uh, exceeds a seasonal very uh, threshold, which is the green line, uh, for at least five consecutive days. The threshold is defined generally as the 90 uh, percentile which is this, uh, uh, as I said, the uh, uh, green line. Um, 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 
you know, uh, uh, of the SST vari variations based on the climatology, which is the climatology system line here. So uh, uh, several major marine heat waves have, have severely impacted marine ecosystem in recent years. Uh, this figure summarizes some of them, and perhaps the most known uh, event is the North Pacific blob, which lasted for two years uh, since uh, 2014 and 15. In Atlantic, which is the focus of uh, today's meeting, um, a strong event occurred in the North Northwest Atlantic in 2012. Sorry about the, the neighbor's dog. Uh, causing uh, low ocean productivity, uh, species range uh, shifts, and uh, also uh, fishery disruption, uh, as you might know. In the Western uh, South Atlantic, uh, a preeminent event occurred in 2014, and I will show its cause and impacts in the following slides. So in a strong summer of, uh, of 2013-14, um, East and South America uh, experienced one of its worst droughts, showing the left panel as negative anomalies of precipitation. The contours are the climatology, and normally at this time of the year, we would have a band of rain uh, called the South Atlantic, so um, the South Atlantic Convergence Zone here. Um, convergence Zone. Uh, associated with the drought, extremes of air temperature occurred over land and uh, in the right panel. At the same time, an unprecedented marine heat wave developed in the Western uh, South Atlantic. These extremes were caused by a persistent uncyclonic uh, circulation, which is showing here in, in the vectors on the left panel, that established over Southeast Brazil, preventing the development of the South Atlantic Convergence Zone and its associated rainfall uh, leading to the drought. So, once the anticyclonic is established, uh, the marine heat wave is generated by local changes in, in um, um, local ch uh, changes of in, in, in the heat flux between the ocean and the atmosphere, mainly by suppressing convection. Uh, the associated lack of clouds, um, uh, uh, decreasing clouds, uh, increases the shortwave uh, radiation at the ocean surface, and weaker winds uh, decrease the, the evaporative cooling leading to the ocean warming. So uh, to find the source of this persistent and cyclonic circulation, we have done several analyses. I don't have the time to show them all today, but this picture, uh, 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 the picture that emerges is showing this schematic. So uh, the total, uh, the tropical deep convection in the Eastern, um, gen, you know, in the Eastern Indian Ocean and Pacific associate with the passage of the Madden Julian Oscillation uh, triggers uh, uh, Rossby wave trains that ultimately lead to the uh, atmospheric blocking here. Um, and then in turn, uh, uh, this, this, this blocking uh, affects local heat fluxes, as I said uh, before, winds and precipitation leading to drought, both land and marine heat wave. So we then applied the same methodology uh, by Hobday et al. Uh, 2016. Uh, to identify all marine heat events during Austral summer from 1982 to 2016. And we noticed that up to 60% of all marine heat waves in this region is a consequence of this persistent and cyclone circulation and therefore are related to the drought and heat wave over land. So we also noticed changes in the occurrence of this marine heat wave events uh, in the recent decades. We noticed not only increasing frequency in the top panel, but duration intensity and, and uh, spatial, uh, spatial uh, extension of these events. And um, um, we all, uh, all these trains here in the side uh, 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 per decade and they are statistically significant and consistent with the global average trends. So, uh, uh, and recently we showed also that the frequency intensity and duration of these marine heat waves will significantly increase for the next decades in the Western South Atlantic using C6 uh, uh, output. Um, and uh, what we've seen is that the most significant trends in, in, in the characteristic of marine heat waves will occur in, between 2000. 21 and 2015, and not by the end of the, the 21st century. And uh, so in the top is frequency, duration, and cum cumulative intensity. Moreover, the future trends are driven not only by long-term warming, but also by the intensification of the atmospheric blocking over the region. 
So we also we are also investigating the impacts of this marine heat waves on, on, on marine ecosystem, and we we already identified that uh, in 2013-14 event caused uh, a decline in the production of this species of plant. Uh, which is very important uh, economically, where I lived here in 27th South. Um, this region is also the biggest producer of oyster, uh, supplying 90% of the market in Brazil. They are cultivated in shallow waters along the base, as you can see here, uh, between the island and the mainland, and are greatly affected by extreme temperature. So, and um, uh, extreme, uh, under extreme temperature, oysters do not reach commercial size, uh, extreme temperatures also lead to the development of a pathogenic microorganism, increasing uh, the risk of uh, infections when consumed by humans. So uh, I put it together this diagram to summarize the effects of this compound extreme. This is just for the 2013-14 event involving drought, land, and marine heat wave. Uh, it led to water and power shortages in Southeast Brazil, a region that is heavily populated, home to more than 8 million people and responsible for 60% of the Brazilian gross domestic product. It also uh, reduced uh, Brazil's soy, coffee, and sugarcane production, impacting food supplies globally and increasing uh, worldwide prices. It decreased the production of oysters and the catch of some commercially important fish species, uh, while decimating clams along the southeast coast of Brazil, as I, as I just showed. This event affected human health by increasing then, um, uh, the risk of uh, heat strokes and vector borne disease. In addition, compound events like this have a disaster impact on ecosystem uh, degradation and loss of uh, uh, marine and land biodiversity. So we recently investigated the most extreme marine heat waves globally. And this study was led by Alex and Kupta shows uh, among other things that a large proportion of um, uh, the most extreme extratropical marine heat wave events were associated with large persistent high pressure system, similar to what I just showed here for the Western South Atlantic. And, uh, and we are now doing an inventory of marine heat waves in the tropical and South Atlantic and the long uh, term linear trend in marine heat wave cumulative intensity are positive in almost the entire South Atlantic during Astro summer. And this is between uh, 1982 to 2020. And, uh, you know, and this in, in Astro summer where the SST is already in its maximum. Gina, just one minute. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just, it's the last slide. We have also identified the co-occurrence of compound events of marine heat waves uh, uh, and high, high acidity and low chlorophyll um, uh, for the period uh, between uh, 1999 and 2018, where these three graded data set overlap. This map shows the frequency in months per decade. Triple compound events were very rare from 1999 to 2008 but became uh, in the left panel here, uh, but became uh, increasingly common from 2009 to 2018, as you can see. So basically my final consideration then uh, is that uh, marine heat waves can co-occur with extreme events on ocean, but particularly on land, such as drought and heat wave. This is very important because our understanding of the physical drivers of the extreme uh, on land and, and our capability of predicting them is much uh, advanced. We should use this uh, 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 our, uh, to our advantage and expand our knowledge and ability to predict the marine heat waves much quicker. We needed to look at the problem more holistically and uh, not just uh, you know in ocean or individually in the land. But that's it. Thank you. Can we just stop sharing here? Thank you so much, Regina. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Filippos Taglis, so I'll pass the microphone over to you. Thank you, Renelis. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Regina. Also, it was a nice introduction and the whole concept for my presentation as well. So the title of my presentation is Increasing Severity of Marine Cold Spells and Marine Heat Waves Along the Southeast uh, Coast in Herself. It's a collaboration with scientists from NOAA, IML Fisheries, University of Miami, the Northern Gulf of, uh, Institute, um, and UC Berkeley. And a little bit of 
background. I cannot switch to the second slide. Maybe take some time to a little bit of uh, background. Observation and satellite data over the past four decades have revealed an increase in the upper ocean heat content and surface temperature globally. And along with the increasing temperature, the frequency and duration of anomalously warm prolonged periods have decreased substantially. But the coastal, re coastal regions may not experience uniform warming as they are subject to different forcing mechanisms like river runoff, upwelling, circulation changes, and also uh, respond faster to atmospheric uh, forcing changes. So back in 2012, Lima et al. Um, investigated the, the decadal uh, trend of sea surface temperature observational data along the coast of the North and South and Central Americas. And they, they have a very nice figure here uh, with the trend from January to November for each region. And reading this paper, what struck me was this negative trend during um, the winter months for the South Atlantic Bight and the Gulf of Mexico, where for the South Atlantic Bight starts late fall, early uh, winter, and ends late uh, winter, early, early spring. And same, uh, but weaker for the Gulf of Mexico. So, the objectives um, of this study are to examine the sea surface temperature mean and variance changes, changes along the south and southeast US coast and interpret those changes in the context of marine cold and, and warm events. And to do so, we are using the uh, NOAA high resolution blended analysis of daily SST coverage from 1981 to present on a 40 degree um, grid uh, resolution and we'll be focusing uh, in this area in particular. And we start uh, by investigating the decadal changes of sea surface temperature for the two seasons of winter and the summer as the mean surface temperature from 2010 to 2020, 19 to 2000, and the same for the summer. And it was striking how the, there is a cooling strip present in the inner shelf region in the northern Gulf of Mexico and the South uh, Atlantic Bight, contrast with the warming observed in the open water. And also the South Atlantic Bight experienced a more severe cooling trend during the winter with a negative change for more than two degrees. During the summer, the, the, the warming is pretty much um, uniform with no significant trend in the uh, East Florida coast. So having this in mind, we construct um, two masks for the inner shelf region of the Gulf of Mexico and the South Atlantic Bight. Those are the Greek points for the two uh, masks. And we, prefer, um, we perform a, a statistical analysis looking at the probability density function of sea surface temperature for those two regions per decade. So each color represents different period. And what we, we observe is that the dust vertical line as well as the, the mean, since the mean. So it's easy to see that from the beginning of the period, 1982 to date, we see a shift towards lower temperatures during the winter uh, with the higher percentiles remain unchanged. So we have an increase in the variance, in, in the variance of sea surface temperature, uh, but only in the one way. Uh, and this is more clear in the South uh, Atlantic Bight. So practically, if we use the 10th percentile, which is the threshold for the marine cold spells, we can see that the area increases, which practically means the likelihood of marine cold spell occurrence is increasing um, and expected to be with maximum intensities and longer duration. Um, so having this in mind and going for the summer season, we see that the there is a, a shift in the toward, towards higher temperature in the distribution. And the higher season, we, have a, we see a higher seasonal maxima and minima for both regions, which also increases the likelihood of marine heat waves occurrence with great maximum intensities. So we have the same tendency, but for uh, probably two different, totally different uh, mechanisms. So having this in mind, we use for the marine cold spell 
similar definition. It's the same definition for as hot the doll as Regina showed in the previous uh, slide. But for now, the, the threshold is the 10th percentile instead of 19th. And whatever is below, uh, anomaly below the 10th percentile for a prolonged period of four, more than five days is uh, an event. And looking now on the change in the frequency of the marine cold spell events and the maximum intensity in terms of interdicatal changes as well, it's certain that the, the inner self region experienced a, a significant increase of up to four um, more events per winter, which is a decadal trend of two more uh, events uh, per decade. And it's clear also in the time series for both the South Atlantic Bight and the Gulf of Mexico, although there is a clear trend in uh, lower frequency variability, there's a strong um, interannual variability as well. So it, it, it's clear that both the, uh, the frequency and the maximum intensity have similar patterns um, and increase substantially. So it's something important to, to document. And during the summer, we have the similar um, behavior, but this is not clear for the whole mask of the Gulf of Mexico region, mostly on the West Florida coast and the South Atlantic Bight from Florida coast, Georgia, South and North Carolina. Again, there is a clear trend, strong trend, but strong in the annual variability uh, as well. So the, the difficult part as the next step is to, to, to figure out what's going on, what are the year-to-year -year changes. Uh, and I'll have this as a summary uh, of these uh, results so far. So while the open ocean experienced warmer temperatures year long, regions of the inner self experience sustained with the time cooling. And the inner self regions experience an increased number of intense marine cold spells during the winter, marine heat waves during the summer. And the question is uh, how these increase in frequency and intensity exerts an additional seasonal stress to the regional uh, ecosystem. And what we're working on currently is what's the causing the increased variance during the winter. And we're looking into the climate modes of variability and frequency of uh, smaller scale and shorter in time uh, weather events. It's kind of, it's a little bit tricky, but uh, it's uh, it's getting more interesting with uh, time. Uh, and I will stop. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Mariana. Sorry. No, I was going to say yeah. Thank you, Filippo. And we open the floor to Tatiana. You know, say everybody like yeah. Uh, hold into your questions. We're going to have time for a discussion right after uh, Tatiana's talk. But also feel free to type your question in the chat in the meantime. All right. What a fun set of talks. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, what we think might be happening at the base of the food web. I'm going to use a few different examples, uh, and many of them are not from the field. Uh, so I thought I would start by saying, although I'm going to show you examples not from the field, um, a good part of what I do is actually um, observing. Uh, I run the Narragansett Bay long-term plankton time series. It's one of the world's longest running time series. And while that has been running, we have great documentation that the temperature has also been increasing. Um, I'm also a principal investigator on the newly funded uh, NSF supported Northeast US Shelf LTER, which stands for Long-Term Ecological uh, Research Program. Uh, so in fact, I'm going out next week across the shelf where we have been looking at heat waves. I'm not gonna talk about that uh, today, but I'm really excited about this group and we'll um, hopefully uh, join in in future meetings. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about carbon fixation, uh, also known as photosynthesis. Uh, here's this beautiful picture of terrestrial uh, photosynth photosynthesis happening in the Caribbean. Uh, when we look at photosynthesis happening on land, um, it is uh, solely composed of uh, land plants. That's the bulk of uh, photosynthesis on land. When we go into the ocean uh, and into marine waters, it's a totally different world. And here's a, a composite picture of some different uh, marine phytoplankton. Uh, and if we look at their underlying evolutionary history, 
uh, we see that they actually span across the tree of life. Okay, so here we have this uh, tree of life. Oh, I should have said, you know, here, here are animals over here. <laughs> our plants. Uh, and, and I know you have a range of backgrounds in this group. So uh, if this is review for you, just hold tight, we'll get some more stuff. But I really want to start this talk by pointing out that these organisms that are in one single liter of water um, are across the eukaryotic tree of life and include cyanobacteria. So we have bacteria. And that makes it that can make it really difficult to um, give sort of blanket statements about how the base of the food web is going to change but it provides us with an opportunity to dive in um, and examine how sort of evolutionary background will influence response to heat wave. So you've seen some version of this, so I won't spend any time on that except um, to talk about this last question, which is how do phytoplankton respond to this kind of um, sea surface temperature variation that's, that's above, um, in this case, uh, in this Hobdale, Hobday, uh, figure this threshold value, but you know, also above climatological values. So to do that, I'm going to use two different sort of vignettes to talk about as we impose climate change on phytoplankton in warmer waters. So one is the general features of phytoplankton responses to a warmer world. And then I want to talk a little bit about why the details of community composition of this evolutionarily diverse community might actually matter during marine heat waves. So a few general features. Um, so some observations we have about heat waves um, are that they can really reshape phytoplankton communities. I'm gonna give you an example here of, we'll call it a captive heat wave. Uh, and this is an experiment we did inside of Narragansett Bay. Um, this is a wintertime heat wave, which actually we're really interested in because uh, we have a lot of uh, primary production and a lot of blooms that, that feed uh, the food web in the wintertime. Our big springtime bloom in Narragansett Bay can occur at temperatures of three or four degrees, two to four degrees. Uh, so here we have an initial community. Each color represents a different phytoplankton species. And we uh, maintained after 10 days, sort of an average heat wave duration, we maintain these um, at their initial temperature as well as moving them down and up in terms of the um, temperature scale. And you can see a really nice uh, shift in terms of how these communities change. And the organisms that I have here on the right are different sizes, shapes, and nutritional values. Uh, and so you can imagine their impact both on export out of the uh, water column, as well as export in um, to the food web may differ dramatically. So we know that heat waves can reshape phytoplankton communities. So how do we deal with this in, from a modeling perspective? Uh, phytoplankton are often treated as a single group or as small and large size fractions at best. And we know that size and phytoplankton can vary dramatically uh, over, over many orders of magnitude. So in these models, temperature, the temperature growth relationship is of course a key model, a key parameter, right? You wanna know how fast they're gonna grow in response to shifting temperatures. And currently, and most frequently, a single relationship is applied to all phytoplankton, despite those vast differences that I showed you in taxonomy, that they have in size and physiology. And that curve that we use is Epley, and I'm sure all of you in your introductory biological oceanography course have learned about the Epley curve. Uh, we wanted to see uh, whether it matters if we start to look at the underlying uh, evolutionary response of these organisms. So our evolutionary history of these organisms. So we examined the thermal responses of key phytoplankton taxa. We went into the, um, into the literature and compiled over 3000 growth measurements from four principal contributors to primary production. Then we made projections for phytoplankton growth with ocean warming. And there's important application to understanding responses to marine heat waves. So here's one of the figures from uh, from the paper published by my former PhD student. Uh, she's recently wrapped up. Uh, and so what I wanna show you on this graph, what you're seeing here are these, all the data uh, that we could compile from the literature for coccolithophores, cyanobacteria, diatoms, and dinoflagellates. The dotted line is the Epley curve. And 
the colored line is the line of best fit for the data for each of these taxa. So why does that matter? Um, very briefly, we could do projections um, into the future, not accounting for um, heat waves. And we can see how um, these different um, taxa will change in their proportional growth with latitude. So you can see that there are winners and losers, and it depends on latitude. And we can also look into the future and make predictions. In this case, I'll point out here for cyanobacteria, we can make predictions about where their range will actually expand into the future. Okay, so it gives us a new parameterizations for examining uh, phytoplankton response to climate change. So if I take this data and I put it all on one graph, you can really see how these slopes differ, right? So if you're modeling temperature changes, even in a heat wave scenario, how you model the response of growth rate to temperature will be very different for these different organisms. Okay, I'm gonna move on in the last two and a half minutes to um, why we think the details of community composition matter. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about now drilling in even a little further, don't be scared, I'll try to take you there, um, to look at intraspecific diversity. So diversity within a species. So like humans, not all cells within a species are identical and there's significant physiological diversity among clonal lineages. So here's a chain of cells. They're all asexually, uh, they originate through asexual division. And here's another one. And they may be genetically different and have different physiologies. Well, natural selection can actually act on physiological differences. So evolution should be in action during heat waves, people. They divide, these organisms divide once a day, once every other day, twice a day, fast dividers. So they're gonna be winners and losers, even within species at the time scales of heat waves. And so where you have a situation where you have an initial community and you alter the temperature through a heat wave and you get this nice change in community composition, we're now asking what happens within that community to the variation that exists. So are we also changing the genetic composition of species and altering their fitness? And the answer here is maybe. There are very few studies uh, uh, I was on a, a project with my collaborator and her postdoc, uh, Toby Samuels, and this is work with Sinead Collins at the University of Edinburgh. She's an evolutionary biologist. And we, I'm not gonna go into detail with this, but basically we saw that growth and death rates under different kinds of heat wave scenarios and extremes of heat wave really varied by genotype. So there's the potential for that. Tatiana, one minute. Sorry. Thank you. It's perfect timing. So, um, so thermal tolerance varies among lineages. So as you go along this, this thermal uh, reaction norm, growth rate might be increasing, it might be decreasing. And we wanted to look at this in Southern Ocean phytoplankton. And we saw thermal variation both within and among species. And I'm gonna just go quickly ahead to this. And, and what we wanted to show with this is that if we fo fast forward um, into the future, we can see that phytoplankton biogeography changes depending on what strain you might have looked at in the lab. So here's a phytoplankton whose um, projected growth area or biogeographic range it increases by 97%, depending on whether you happen to study in the lab the slowest or the least heat tolerant strain or the most heat tolerant strain. So we have to incorporate this variation into our um, estimates. So I'll, I'm going to stop there and, and give you an, a summary slide. And that is that First, phytoplankton are incredibly diverse. Heat waves can reshuffle plankton communities. And I hope I've shown you some new tools we have for testing hypotheses about the ecosystem consequences of heat waves, both on sort of ecological and evolutionary timescales, which in the phytoplankton are shown. With that, I'll say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Thank you so much, Filippo and Regina, um, for the amazing presentations. So we are going to have now some time for questions. Like uh, we open, the floor is open for questions. People can raise their hands or, or just go on, uh, unmute yourself and ask the, the question directly. I can start with one. I have a lot of questions, but I'll start with one. Um, so we know right now, as we're saying, like, yeah, marine heat, heat waves is such an important topic right now. Like we are seeing like the increasing temperature in UK, in many other cities. Um, 
what's the relationship of the heat wave on land with the marine heat waves and how is that related to climate change? Tatiana, you mentioned like winter uh, heat waves, winter marine heat waves. Yeah, can you talk about like, yeah, how, how is the, the heat wave on land related to the marine heat waves and what is a winter uh, heat wave? Um, yeah, you know, it's a, that's a, a great question. And, and I think particularly for near shore and estuarine regions, right? The land heat waves can have, a, I think, an impact on what's going on uh, in the marine environment. And it may have a lot to do with the associated uh, impacts. So in the winter, if we have a heat wave and the snow melts, that creates runoff and it creates a freshet in the estuary, which will then have a secondary impact on these organisms that may, as I said, there are differences, evolutionary differences among these organisms. Some have higher or lower salinity, uh, low salinity tolerance. Um, so I think there's going to, there will be these kinds of interactions where the land terrestrial heat wave will have sort of downstream consequences for coastal and estuarine uh, in, in very local ways um, for some of these organisms. So that's one example. Thank you. And then if someone else wants to pitch in or we can go for an next question. I saw there was a question that somebody posted, but I lost it. I think it was related to what type of observations are best to study uh, marine heat waves and marine cold spells. Yeah, and, and I think it's just a question to all of the panelists. Yeah, and he'll uh, send a question. Yeah, what kind of observation system do you need to understand marine heat waves uh, beyond SST? I yeah, think, uh, I think it's open to anyone. Well, first of all, the problem is that uh, it, it, we don't have too many uh, uh, observing systems uh, that daily, at least daily observations and continues. The, the thing is to to, to understand or, or to determine the, the, the extreme, we need to have a climatology to know what is the extreme. And this is the problem. We have to have a long-term uh, uh, observing system and with a higher frequency, I'm saying at least, at least uh, daily. And this is a problem, you see. Um, and most of what we have is already uh, from, uh, say we use uh, SST anomalies from satellite, which is the surface temperature, from uh, 1982 and, and, and 1982 on is already, we already probably have a shift uh, uh, on the baseline. So, um, but yes, we need, uh, uh, and also we don't have a good understanding on the subsurface, even worse, because then obviously satellite data. And as, as um, uh, Philippe said too, uh, in a coastal area, you know, is a problem. It's very different. He showed how different it is from the coastal area to open sea, you see. And so is we need a uh, coastal particular, I think, long-term uh, in-situ data and subsurface data. I, would, I can add to that if, Go on. if there's time. So from, and I, I love that, that you said, you know, we really need these long-term and continuous monitoring platforms or systems. Uh, particularly for the biology, because they can change so rapidly, um, we do need um, observational platforms. I'm thinking of um, in situ instruments like the IFCB, that's the imaging flow cytobot, for example, or flow cytometers. One of the more challenging things though for the biology, and, and this is particularly important for modelers who wanna use some of that data is really what we really care about are the rates and the rates of change. So we might want to know the rates of primary production and how those change during marine heat waves, right? We might want to know the rates of um, grazing and loss during a marine heat wave. So I feel like that's a much tougher nut um, to crack. And then the last one is we might also want to know um, how, how the heat wave changes the balance of nutrients. And I can give you a really cool example from our um, Northeast Shelf LTR. Uh, it just started in 2017. Our first cruise was in 2018. Um, our second or third year out there, there was a heat wave on the, on the shelf. And um, we saw a bloom of um, nitrogen fixers, which is unusual in this area. The shelf is too cold. And then, so we saw a bloom of nitrogen fixers. So suddenly, we are changing the flow and sources of nitrogen into the system. 
right? And so now if we're just looking at nitrate concentrations or ammonium concentrations, that is inadequate to really describe the action of the nitrogen fixers, but they're not part of our models in those um, habitats. So I think we have also some really new things to learn about how the ecosystem is responding and we may have to adjust um, some of our assumptions when it comes to modeling how they'll respond. Thank you. Um, Filippo, if you could talk more about, <clears throat> sorry, about like code spell, like um, how does climate change affect code spell? Like does it, um, and what are some of the impacts we predict uh, on the biology? Um, how does code spell is gonna affect uh, any biological consequence in, in the future? So particularly in this region, for example, in the South and Southeast uh, US coast, and um, along the Florida coast, the region is um, um, primarily affected from climate mode uh, indices like the ENSO and AO more importantly. For example, in 2010, there was extreme negative NAO um, uh, year, winter, which caused a record low temperatures, but it's not one way or one thing, it's, it's impossible or at least it's not straightforward to understand what are the climate modes on the background, because you also have higher frequency atmospheric events of a small, shorter uh, time scale. Now on the, what's the impact of biology? One <clears throat> important and direct um, impact is, for example, if you have excessive cooling, you have excessive mixing and you uh, have excessive um, nutrient, um, availability in the euphoric layer. So, and then goes on with primary production and everything. Um, what I cannot answer right now, and it's interesting in this study is this um, enhanced seasonality with extreme uh, warmer summers and colder uh, winters, how this is going to stress the, the organism. This is gonna be, we work beneficial or, um, will cause further stress. Thank you. Mariana, I see that Regina yeah. has her hand yeah. up. Go on. Uh, just uh, two points I want to make. One is uh, about the cold spell. We are doing some studies here in the coast uh, uh, region where we have upwelling and we are using this methodology to actually link to, to upwell events. And uh, in, in our coast here, we see that uh, uh, the frequency of uh, cold spells has decreased and the intensity has decreased too in the terms that they are uh, getting weaker. Uh, at the same time, the marine heat wave events are increasing and getting stronger. Um, but th this is just here, just to add. And one thing that I think uh, it was from the previous uh, uh, question about climate change, uh, in this region that we studied, we noticed that it's not only just a, a result of the warming, the impact of the climate change, because obviously the warming, 90% of the heat is going to the ocean. So obviously we are uh, uh, raising the climatology and that it makes easy to pass the threshold, just that. But also uh, uh, in our case, that is intensification of the mechanism too, you see, which is the blocking the atmospheric blocking also intensify. And this is not just for the subtropical South Atlantic. It seems to be actually one of the responses of uh, um, um, all, all the subtropical regions. And the final thing, sorry, I don't wanna, uh, is the impact also in terms of land and ocean. Um, uh, um, Tatiana just mentioned one, one in the winter, but here, uh, if it's associated with the drought, then you have less uh, runoff. And if you needed that nutrient, for instance, then you have a problem of uh, uh, less nutrient. So it's the other way around, let's say for the summer, particularly in this subtropical regions. That's all. Thank you. Uh, I don't see another question from people, but I do have a question. Uh, in your presentation, Regina, you had said that like marine heat waves would be stronger from 2021 to 2050. What is gonna happen after that that's gonna change the trend? Well, 
that is uh, one detail that is good to just to to say is that uh, you can do a running mean if you shift the the the, the clim climatology obviously but we didn't want to do that why we didn't want to that do that because we are interested with the impacts and so uh, the question is that for for the marine ecosystem are they going to evolve quick enough so in that case we didn't use a, a kind of a change in climatology so using the climatology from now uh, uh, we already reached the limit because the temperatures can't can't uh, exceed 30 in the oceans because you know after that they evaporate so the maximum that you get is generally 30 degrees Celsius in the ocean so and we reach already that value in 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 South Atlantic you see in this area so basically in, two, in between 2021 and 50 you already we already actually reach the limit and the whole summer is a pretty much marine heat wave basically you know, so so then you know by the end of the century, it's just uh, you know. So the the biggest increase is already happening is much faster than you think. You see, uh, is is in the near future, not in the far future. By the end of the century, I'm not sure if I answered the question. Yes, thank you. Can I can I add something to Regina? Sure, go on. Since I don't see. It hands up at the moment, but question about, uh, sorry, response to Regina's point is, you know, for the thinking about the diversity that sits within the phytoplankton community, one thing that we're hypothesizing is that these heat waves, in a, so I, remember I said they're different strains and they are competing also against each other. Some are gonna be winners, some are gonna be losers. Uh, this is even within a single species, that these heat waves may be acting to sort of pre-adapt, if you will, these organisms for the sustained high temperatures that Regina talked about, right? So you have a little heat wave, there's some lineage selection, the ones that do really well uh, survive, whether they can do well again when the heat wave goes away is another question and survivability. But there are, we think there are ways that these heat waves might actually be acting to sort of pre-adapt the communities. Um, the direction that that's gonna happen and the speed are all still unknown and really interesting questions. Um, but uh, it could could be it could be a, a buffering mechanism actually toward, towards dealing with uh, sort of sustained heat. Go on, Renalis. I I wanted to encourage people to post their questions in the chat, but and I think somebody just did, but I don't know if it's a comment. Maybe you can look at it. <laughs> um, but I did have one question for Tatiana. Um, I really thought it was fascinating that evolution can happen in the span, or there could be some a little evolutionary shifts in the spans of some of these events. And I wondered if that was something that you could really test in the field, or if that had to be tested in controlled laboratory experiments to see if in, you know, the, the timing of successive uh, warming or cooling events, you could see these, these shifts in the genetic makeup of a community. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I was thinking about that this morning before the talk, like, you know, let's think about, you know, can we, how do we write a proposal to say we're going to that heat wave in two years? Tough, but, you know, think about how we can get out in the field to do this. Uh, but I can give you one example uh, from some work we did uh, in the field, uh, looking at the effects of ocean acidification on your question, not marine heat waves. But as Regina said, um, they're connected. <laughs> so in this example, we were out with um, Ulf Ribezel, who is was doing work uh, in a fjord and what had these large mesocosm bags. People are probably familiar with them in one way or another, these large mesocosm bags. And then we could set up different uh, pH levels in those um, different levels of ocean acidification in those bags. And we actually collected strains before the experiment after the experiment, during the experiment, so on and so forth. And yes, you could see uh, the you could see the evidence of evolutionary response within a single species in the duration of those mesocosm bags that had all the grazers and you know, had most of the ecosystem processes happening. And again, that was with my colleague um, Sinead Collins and her um, then postdoc Matthias Scheinen. And yeah, you could see an adaptation of these organisms. The ones that had seen higher CO2 grew better under high CO2. And that there's not enough time in, in those experiments for de novo mutation. 
that's all selection of standing variation. So I, I think it can happen um, potentially quite quickly. And I'd love to test it for heat waves. I'd love to be able to predict where one is gonna be solidly enough that I could write a proposal on that. So anyone has ideas, let me know. Gina, you have a comment? Yeah, it's just to say that uh, there is this 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 aspect that I've seen some work already doing also the synergy between these extremes, right? And that they, you know, the impact. And then I, it, this is this is one thing that we needed to understand because it's it's not just marine heat wave or as as uh, high acidity events, but we have actually that combined with low productivity and. But then, uh, uh, um, and and the the thing that I would like to emphasize is that uh, when when I give this talk and we discuss with physical oceanographers or climatologists, uh, they always want to say, "Oh, but I, how you define the extreme and everything?" And then they 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 focus on a statistic. But I would think that we have to work together with people from marine ecosystem and all all the other parts because that's how you know it. Uh, which strategy and which technique we're going to use to define the extremes? I think it, it dependable of the impact of that. You not just look to the hazard, which is just the physical aspect of it, but actually uh, doing the work, thinking about the impact. If the species are uh, 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 are able to evolve very quickly, then maybe use uh, climat uh, climatology running uh mean thing or or but if it's not it, it will depend on on the response and what you want to 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 say and i give this as an example like the flooding in germany maybe it became common and and now it's not uh uh, uh considered anymore uh, uh extreme but are we prepared for the impacts of that obviously not so that is a Jewish extreme maybe statistically is not anymore considered extreme nowadays, but the impacts are really extreme. And so uh, that's what I, I, I think we, we needed to start working more interdisciplinary for particularly in this subject. Thank you so much. Um, I would say like we go around the room, like we have like give a few minutes for each person to just give some, uh, each one of the panelists first, like. Of course, everybody, if you have questions, like we still have a few minutes, but otherwise I'll go around the room and just like uh, each one of the panelists, if you could give a few, like, yeah, a few remarks uh, in the end, maybe like what are the biggest challenges, like in some very quickly, um, some messages like to people to take um, from, from this. And Regina, you can go on, you're already. Okay. <laughs> it's speaking too much. Anyway, so, so I think it, my, my point that I would like to do is because I know that there are some questions about how we measure, and I know that there are some people here that are really uh, uh, in, 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 interesting, and, and this is a really important how we, we observe this. And one point that I want to make is that we always getting more uh, um, expensive and high technology um, instruments that are very expensive and not available for the global south. What I would ask is to try to come up with solutions. Yes, you can have if if countries that can afford the high tech and uh, observing system do it, no doubt. But for the rest of us in the global south, if we have like actually simple solutions, simple instruments, right? Because it's better to have something that is maybe less accurate, maybe less precise, but have any. It, some data than not having any, right? And uh, so, because it's very easy to to move to the ever more expensive and 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 you know um, uh, high tech uh, instruments, but this is not available for the global south, and we need urgent uh, start measuring in, in those regions that are lacking measurements. That's my final comment. Thanks. Thank you, Filippo. You want to go on? Uh, yeah, I'm saying to, to Simone, I'll feed back, Simone's feedback on the use of observation and models together. I think they're complementary and models are particularly useful, useful because they provide um, better spatial data, like everywhere and uh, in the frequency needed. 
Uh, but it has to be taken care with, um, be careful when looking into that, perform the right, um, some sort of evaluation of, of the model for what is the question we want to answer. Is the model reliable in the specific region or not? Is the, um, the dynamics resolved? Um, what we're looking at for the processes missing? But yeah, overall, it's a useful tool. I think uh, everybody who's looking at the data would like to also look at the models, how they perform, and if aligns with observations. <laughs> Great tool, of course. Thank you, Tatiana. I'd like to to say a few words. Uh, yeah, I think. Hopefully, I got the message across that we think diversity matters, right? And that these heat waves kind of knock things off of their well adapted spot, and that might change composition. It might lead to evolution. One thing I didn't mention, but we really all need to keep in mind if we're thinking about how ecosystem. Uh, effects will kind of play out under heat waves is that they're also the grazers and the grazers have their own response to heat. And so I, I'm throwing out a, a hypothetical. So Regina sees lower chlorophyll associated with these marine heat waves. It could be that production is cranking along as it always has rates of production, but that actually the grazers are like, oh, it's warmer. I've got a higher metabolism. I'm going to do a little bit more grazing. Maybe I'm breathing more, so the CO2 is getting released again, but I'm also pooping more, so there's more export. So um, maybe the seabirds like that because it's some krill that they like. So I think keeping it into account, there's the gain of the phytoplankton and then the loss processes of the grazers. And I don't think we have that very well parameterized how they are going to respond. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Regina. Thank you, Filippo and Tatiana, uh, for the great presentations and thanking people to be engaging in the conversation. Um, thank you, everybody, for being part of the Ocean Hour. I'm going to stop the recording. Um,